So again, just gonna do um, an intro of our panel that we have this afternoon. Um, retired Colonel Felicia French served 32 years in the US Army and Arizona National Guard as a nurse, medevac helicopter pilot, state equal employment officer and senior medical advisor in Afghanistan. She has also been a single mother, an educator, a sustainability scientist, an activist with Sierra Club and volunteered with Search and Rescue as an emergency response nurse with AmeriCares with Haitian refugees in the Bahamas after Hurricane Dorian and on the Navajo Nation in the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. She also came within 577 votes of flipping a conservative legislative seat in her rural Northern Arizona district as a first time candidate. Now she serves as the Ambulatory Care Program Director for the Women's and Pediatric Clinic at Tuba City Regional Healthcare Center. She has earned a Bachelor of Science in Nursing and a Master of Science in Sustainable Solutions from Arizona State University and a Master of Science in Systems Management from the University of Southern California. Elizabeth Bouchard is Senior Policy Analyst for Moms Clean Air Force. She's also a health coach, author, former clinical research coordinator, and a public health graduate student at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. After becoming a mother, Elizabeth became passionate about the intersection between climate change and family resilience. She is the author of Parenting in a Changing Climate, Tools for Cultivating Resilience, Taking Action, and Practicing Hope in the Face of Climate Change. She lives in Durham, North Carolina with her husband and young twins. Jessica Mingestab is the Program Manager for Climate and Clean Energy and Advocacy with the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments. In her role, Jessica works on outreach and engagement of nurses, nursing organizations, and any partner organizations on climate change and clean energy advocacy campaigns. Jessica also works in the acute care setting, specializing in maternal child health, caring for birthing individuals in labor and delivery and maternity. Jessica draws from her background studies in sociology at Rutgers University and nursing at Villanova University to fuel her passion and work in community health, health equity, and environmental justice. So the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments, or ANI, as we uh, call it for short, is a national network of nurses with the core mission of promoting healthy people and healthy environments by educating and leading the nursing profession and advancing research, incorporating evidence-based practice, and influencing policy. The Alliance is comprised of nurses from a, um, a broad range of both geographical locations and nursing specialties, but all with the unifying desire to protect public health through fighting for environmental policies. And with the increasing severity of climate issues and the clear impacts on public health, which we're gonna outline more in depth today, our efforts as nurses are now more important than ever. So Annie is structured with four forums that meet monthly. They focus on education, um, research, policy and advocacy and practice, and then two committee, committees that focus on climate change and food and agriculture. And we also have a student nurse committee as well. Um, the cornerstone to the work that Annie does is the focus on the power of a personal story. Um, we consistently rely on the fact that nurses um, for many, many years in recent history have been voted the most trusted profession. And that is all related to um, the countless you know, hours of work that we spend taking care of our patients, whether it's in the acute care setting, the community setting, um, or our families at home. Um, everyone, almost everyone has a nurse in their family that they rely on and they ask questions of. Um, and we use that in ways that we engage with elected officials. Um, yeah, so we rely on the, the power um, of our personal stories and, and the fact that like you don't have to have um, an extensive legislative background or a knowledge to be able to in, in, get involved and have the capacity to um, make change, whether it's locally or nationally. So this graphic is gonna give a great overview of the science behind the main contributing components to climate change. On the left side we'll, of the graphic, we see naturally occurring greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide that um, normally trap the sun's heat in our atmosphere and keep us warm. And then on the right side, 
we see the cascade of how human activities like burning of fossil fuels as energy sources um, increase those greenhouse gases to um, dangerously high levels and just cause um, uh, ground level temperatures to be higher and um, different climates or now as we now know it as climate change. This has been a long process, um, but the effects are being felt more strongly every year. And they've brought in from what we once called um, global war warming to um, much differing weather patterns, whether they're more severe in areas that you're used to, or they're occurring in areas where they're not commonly, um, not commonly exhibited or felt. So some examples in most recent times that we all are unfortunately aware of would be the um, severe ice storms and cold weather in the southern part of the country last winter, or um, the severe heat waves that occurred in the Pacific Northwest last summer, both of which those areas um, were grossly, unfortunately, unprepared for and had very, very devastating um, effects on the respective communities. So as climate change is increasing, it's affecting humans, animals, and our environments that we all live in and share. There is an interconnectedness where each group has an impact on the other. And the health of people is closely connected to the health of animals and plants and all of the, the shared environment that they all exist within. And this concept is called One Health. It's a collaborative, multi-sectorial, and transdisciplinary approach supported by the CDC. Um, and it's being affected even more by climate change and it's cascading all the way up again to um, from wildlife to humans. Um, a wide known example of climate change's impact on One Health, on the One Health narrative would be the rise of vector-borne diseases like Zika and West Nile virus. And in the Northeast where I'm located, uh, Lyme's disease is a very, very prevalent um, issue that we're dealing with quite a bit up here. Um, and our, an example in Arizona that I learned about recently are um, closer encounters with wildlife like cougars and bobcats that are coming closer into communities to um, seek water and seek refuge um, from heat and from the severe drought that's been going on. I'm gonna turn it over to Felicia for some more um, local examples of climate change and how that's affecting um, individuals specifically in Arizona. Uh, first, I want to thank you the, for being here and tuning into this and your interest and in hopefully your advocacy for uh, health care um, and how uh, climate change affects health care. Uh, let me go over a few things. Uh, there's an acronym called Heat Wave that uh, the Medical Society uh, Consortium has come up with, and it's really, really appropriate, especially here in Arizona. Um, the, as you see, we all know heat illness is very, can be deadly. Uh, what most people don't know, though, is that of all the natural disasters, um, heat kills more people than any other natural disaster, than tsunamis, tornadoes, earthquakes, all that, because it affects uh, almost everyone, anywhere, it can be affected by it, but specifically, obviously, with the climate change, the global temperatures rising, uh, and the worst part of it is that the extreme, the heat is, is not so much that it's hot, it's always been hot in Arizona in the summertime, but when I was a kid growing up in Arizona in the 60s, it would cool down to the upper 70s at least. So in the morning you woke up and it seemed cool to be out in the upper 70s after being 110 during the day. Well, now we're getting temperatures of well over 100 degrees, 110, so up to 115, even up to 120. I believe the hottest was in June of, of um, 90, 91, it was, went to 124. But, uh, but the worst part is that it's staying hot longer, so you, have, you don't have a reprieve from it. And that's what really is the killer, is your body doesn't have a chance to cool down. It's constant under a barrage of heat stress. So that heat illness is, is, is carrying on for, for everyone longer. And then of course, uh, people that are more vulnerable, are those that can't thermoregulate as well, our elderly, our children, our immune, you know, people who aren't as in shape and, uh, and pregnant women in particular. So uh, the heat illness is really affected. It's being exacerbated by, uh, by the longer heat waves uh, where you, some days it doesn't even drop below hundred degrees at night. So you're just, you never get a reprieve from it. Then asthma 
uh, Arizona used to be the place to come for uh, kids with asthma or any respiratory ailment back, uh, you know, before the 60s and 70s. And now asthma has gotten worse here because now, in addition to the the pollution, you have that dirt, you see that brown layer of haze covering the city, whereas most cities were pollution, you see it looks more gray. Well, in Arizona, you got the drought, the dirt, the dust, has caused, the, the drought has caused dirt and dust in the air to be blown all over the place. And now those particulates of pollution, nitrous oxide, uh, carbon dioxide, methane, all adhere to that dust. So you have a, uh, a you know, these a much thicker cloud of that. So it really, uh, exacerbates the people with respiratory ailments such as asthma or emphysema. So it's it's very, uh, it's gotten much worse than it was before uh, the, with the drought and the heat and the droughts make it much worse. Then you have traumatic injury, like I said, the pregnant women, the, they've done a study over 32 million uh, pregnant women in the last uh, 10 plus years. And they've shown that they're much more apt to have uh, premature, uh, early births of uh, children, premature babies, lower birth weights, which as a result tend to be less, less chance of survival uh, for them. And that, that's caused uh, uh, a lot of problems for, uh, for everyone. People, you know, have a, you know, for pregnancy and again, back to, you know, elderly people and children. Water and foodborne illnesses definitely, when you have, you may think, well, if it's a drought, well, how do you get water and foodborne illnesses? Well, you also have like stagnant pools, things that were lakes or ponds or streams, they dry out and they have puddles now instead of running water. So uh, vector-borne uh, diseases, the in insects will lay their eggs in those. And so, you know, they'll, they'll find a way um, uh, and then you get more uh, illnesses for, from that vector-borne uh, diseases. Allergies, definitely much worse. The pollen, when I was growing up here also, it was not as bad as it is now. First of all, everyone was moving to Arizona and bringing their plants from other places that were uh, native to Arizona. So then now you have all that pollen. Now on top of it, you have longer growing seasons before you have free, we had freezes. So that prevented so many plants from growing. And that may seem like counterintuitive that you want a longer growing season, but not when it's not native plants. So you have more pollen. It used to be freezes much longer. Now there's three weeks less uh, on average of freezing temperatures. So the weeds, the things that cause more pollen are growing more rapidly and putting more pollen out in the air. And then you throw in that when there's not as much rain, instead of it being washed away, it just gets into the dust and collects with the dust. Again, just back to that uh, adhering to the dirt and dust, the pollution, the pollen is all these particulates are hanging out in the air longer. And uh, emotional stress of, of heat just alone. You know how many people, you know, when you're in the car and it's hot and you have to get your oven mitts on to, to get in the car to drive, it's already was bad enough then. Now it's gotten worse. And uh, people, road rage, you, you definitely has gone up with heat, you get, you know, um, than it does with cold. People, when they're, they're cold, they tend to hibernate. They're just, they, they, they just don't want to even bother with people. They stay inside. They don't go out as much. But the heat, you, you're, you're at, you have to go out and, and take care of things still. And uh, you're just more aggravated when you're hot. Um, you're sweating, you're just miserable. So all those things contribute to, to emotional stress. Yeah. Go ahead. And so the, this is a, a, little, a, a good diagram of all those things I pretty much discussed, but I'll kind of touch on some of the things I didn't, but um, uh, the you know the air pollution we talked about, cardiovascular disease, that's the other thing I didn't mention. Um, when your uh, air pollution causes, uh, exacerbates uh, cardiovascular diseases, as well as kidney diseases um, and uh, pulmonary disease uh, illnesses, it, it, it affects all those. Um, the allergens I talked about, uh, the qual quality of water is uh, al uh, algae blooms uh, also are affected by uh, the, the water uh, quality. Like when we, the rivers, the lakes that are decreasing in, in volume, they're going down, there's puddles there, algae is growing and of course it chokes off this, uh, the fish and it, it affects even our, you know, our wildlife, of course. Uh, water and food supply is impacted by it. The farmers cannot grow as the crops like they used to. One of the main things that we look at here in Arizona, it's always been cattle, cotton, climate, citrus was the five C's and copper. And now the cattle, you were raising alfalfa, growing alfalfa to feed the cattle. Well, alfalfa is extremely water intensive. And so now you're growing uh, that. We can't grow that. So the cattle can't feed off of that. 
And that was a source of income for many people here. So um, again, one of the solutions to that is more plant-based diets. But in the meantime, what about all those ranchers and, uh, and, and uh, their livelihoods are being jeopardized? Then the other uh, forced migration, civil conflict. Uh, um, I've been to many countries when I was in the military traveling around and that we studied uh, the different threats and we always thought oil, you know, lack of oil was gonna be the threat and that's what caused wars. Well, the studies are showing now that lack of water is gonna be the new uh, causes of war because when countries build dams upstream to dam the water so that they can have access to water, fresh water. Well, what about the countries downstream? Now they're choking off their water supply, so they're gonna be angry. So there's a lot of conflict with that. In addition, Syria was a classic example. It's pretty much uh, been, uh, determined that it was the first uh, uh, area where climate change refugees came out of because the farmers in Syria, because the, the drought was so bad, they were subsistence farmers, so they had to move into the cities to get uh, livelihoods now because they couldn't farm anymore, and the cities were already crowded in Syria, you know, and so they, the, the, and you have throw that into that mix, uh, not a less than optimal government, and it's a recipe for disaster. So, and we're seeing that throughout the world now. Many places are, the uh, climate refugees are coming in South America, Central America. There, there's actually drought there, even though it's more of a tropical area, there's less water rainfall there. And, and on top of that, you throw hurricanes in there that makes it worse, they're stronger and tense, but they, they're not, the rainfall is not going throughout the year, it's all at once. And so that causes flooding, mudslides, all that. So you get these climate refugees coming, uh, coming north and through Mexico and on our border as well. Um, heat related illness, death, I talked about that, extreme heat, definitely. Even in the military, we, the training for our soldiers has, we've had to be very careful about training because they, uh, the, they can't train during certain times of the year anymore now. They used to be able to train almost year round, just for certain hours or summer, they cut back, but now it's year round. And, and occupational health for, uh, jobs such as firefighters, police officers, the uh, road const uh, construction workers, uh, those all have been affected by the climate change. They, we have to work here in Phoenix, uh, well, in Phoenix and other areas that are hot at night now. They have the nights, they can't work during the day, so they have to close off uh, the roads and whatnot and just work at night because it's just way too hot for them to work. In fact, just last July, the um, about 12 firefighters after back-to-back -back rescues, three back-to-back -back rescues at uh, Paestoa Peak and, and Camelback Mountain, um, hikers were out there and they had to rescue them from the heat and they got, with all their uh, uh, equipment on, they, they got heat exhaustion and two of them had to be hospitalized for um, ki uh, kidney failure. So, it, and these are young, healthy uh, rescue workers. So it affects, it's gonna affect everyone. Next slide. And again, the price we pay the vulnerable populations. I discussed the children and pregnant individuals is much worse uh, uh, with pregnant women. I, uh, we're seeing that time and time again. Uh, yeah. The elderly, they, uh, a lot of people do not have uh, air conditioning units. In air Swamp coolers are only effective if the humidity is at a certain level, but during the monsoon seasons when the humidity is high and then you throw that heat in there, they're ineffective. So that, that can cause uh, definitely uh, problems with uh, keep keeping your body core temperature down. And in co communities where uh, in the north, like in Flagstaff, most people didn't have air conditioning units. They don't have it. Up in and outside of Arizona and the northern populations, New York, Chicago, all that, Europe, they, they don't have air conditioning units there. They didn't need it. But now with the temperatures rising and, and staying high, people need air conditioning. They don't have it. Most wealthy people or people with, you know, diff, you know a middle class, they can afford to get a, a, you know, a, an air conditioning unit and put in, but lower income communities cannot. And generally speaking, the heat is in the lower uh, socioeconomic and, and people of color. So it's affecting them much more adversely than people with means of uh, that can purchase fans and air conditioning units. Uh, homeless populations, of course, they have no protection whatsoever. They're out there with the elements of the heat, so they, um, they, they, they cannot protect themselves. Individuals with chronic and conditions disabilities, such as, you know, with uh, artery have cardiovascular disease or diabetes, kidney disease, those are all affected. And I talked about occupational groups such as the construction workers, uh, first responders, 
Uh, even the nurses that were outside doing the COVID shots when they had those tents outside um, the last two years in the summertime, the, the, it was really hot for them and, the, and they have to be in full PPE it's in that mask and the, 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 all the ga uh, uh, gowns and the, the, the face shield is extremely hot. I, I know I experienced that when I was here on, and then on the Navajo reservation trying to help with the COVID relief efforts. And then the climate refugees I talked about, they're, they're, they, they, they don't have any protection. And then they're thrown into a pop, you know, population that's not trying to absorb them into the populations uh, 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 you know, here in the United States or in Europe. It's, it's very problematic and uh, I feel for them. It's because it's through no fault of their own, they're being affected by, by this. And a lot of the climate refugees, the underlying thing that people don't address is that the Western countries are the ones who have the slowest amount of population and they, they produce more of the carbon uh, dioxide and the global greenhouse gases than the other populations. You know, the average American consumes so much, they drive, they have cars, uh, the, the, the pollution from there, the housing, the uh, transportation, and just in general, whereas countries that are lower uh, socioeconomic, they don't have houses, those huge houses, they don't have cars, they're not contributing to that pollution and materialism, and yet they're suffering the consequences of that global uh, climate change. So as a national um, nursing organization, we'd also like to highlight um, the many ways in which climate change is going to directly affect our profession as well. Um, so we know inpatient hospital stays are, are getting much, much shorter, um, all the while patients that we're taking care of inpatient are getting sicker. And that obviously is going to drastically increase the workload on nurses. So we're on the heels of the fourth wave of, of the global COVID pandemic, and we're seeing, and obviously many of us nurses are feeling the strain on ourselves and our partners in the healthcare profession. And in recent years, we've seen many examples of how climate change is also has been adding um, an increasing strain um, on our facilities and on our working conditions as well. So here we're just kind of listing a couple of ways that we may have already seen in the past and that a lot of studies are projecting are going to increase in the future. Um, so obviously, as I've mentioned, Felicia has mentioned, it's, there's going to be a sharply increased incidence or exacerbation of existing diseases. So we know poor air quality can either aggravate asthma or in some instances can cause new cases of asthma. Um, COVID-19 is a you know pulmonary uh, pulmonary virus that is has you know caused a strong um, rate of compromised respiratory function. So when you're in a hotter climate with reduced air quality and you know more pollution, that's going to be even more exacerbated. So that's going to mean more um, more visits to the ER, more admissions to inpatient units, um, all the while while we have um, less nurses and more nurses leaving the profession who are be due to you know, burnout and being overwhelmed. Um, structural damage and infrastructure disruptions. Um, I'm sure we all remember in many seasons now in the past, in the most previous years, wildfires in California, the Pacific Northwest, and even Arizona, where you literally see nurses and healthcare professionals like evacuating their patients as things are going on in the surrounding um, communities. So that's a severe example, but then also just power outages due to severe storms like hurricanes that we experience in the Northeast up here. Um, supply chain disruptions of pharmaceuticals, um, necessary pharmaceuticals and supplies, and then in general, just overall um, increased patient needs, whether they are medical needs for, you know, severely sick patients or social needs for patients who, you know, their, their neighborhoods are disrupted, um, their access to re necessary resources necessary resources are also disrupted. Um, all of those things are going to make it difficult to do the jobs that we like to do, which is just to take care of our patients, whether it's in the hospital or in the community setting. And then this graphic kind of goes into it a little more, a little bit more in detail. And we'll have the slides sent out to everyone afterwards just to kind of refer to it more. Um, but it basically shows in every sector that we've talked about, and in addition to other ones, 
um, that over time from the next like three to five years and then even 10 years and past that, um, the strain on all of these aspects of the healthcare setting in which nurses work is going to get um, more and more severe as climate change um, continues to increase. And I'm going to pass it on to Elizabeth because um, she has a lot of great strategies and coping um, mechanisms and tactics that we can start to engage in um, going forward. Thank you, Jessica, and thank you, Felicia, for sharing so much really important information uh, with us. I know for myself, you know, I've heard so much of this material so many times, but it's never easy to take in. And um, I'm going to share some ideas for what we can actually do moving forward now that we know more uh, about how climate change is going to impact the healthcare profession. Um, and the first thing that I always recommend to people is something that I'm imagining uh, those of y'all in the room may have already done, is to join a climate community, such as Annie or Moms Clean Air Force. There's really no better way to amplify the impact of your actions than to be acting with other people who care. So many benefits to, uh, to being a part of a, a community that's taking action. Um, one of them is uh, that it can help our mental health, right? So after hearing all of the information that you just heard, one thing I've heard so many times is that when people first kind of wake up to the climate crisis, there's just, uh, there can be a sense of deep isolation, right? There may not be people in your immediate neighborhood or your family talking about this, right? And so when we hear, learn all of these uh, really difficult things to take in, we can feel very much alone. But if we um, can find those other people who care and take action with them, that actually can benefit our, our mental health um, can make action feel more sustainable and, and, and fun. And we really need for, for the activism that we're engaging in to feel, um, to feel like something that we can be part of for a long time because we're, we're all gonna be needed in this movement for, for many years to come. Uh, there was an interesting study that came out uh, in March uh, from researchers at, at Yale University showing that for people who experience climate anxiety, which is many of us uh, these days, um, being a part of a, a, a community that was taking collective action um, was associated with reduced symptoms of depression. So there are um, uh, clear benefits to our mental health uh, from joining with other people who care. Next slide, please. Another thing that I uh, really encourage people to do, uh, again, is something that I'm sure y'all are, are already engaging in, um, is to make our climate actions into habits. So as healthcare professionals, as, as nurses, you know well how important healthy habits are for your patients. You know that in order to be healthy, they need to be eating well, they need to be exercising, they need to be drinking enough water and getting enough sleep. These are basic uh, habits for, for human health, but healthy advocacy habits are important for our communities and our planet too. And there's so many different ways to approach this, um, as many different ways as individuals, but some ideas that I encourage people to um, begin with, if you're not already doing these, are to call your representatives on a weekly basis and tell them that you care about climate change. Each one of you has a personal story, has, a, has healthcare expertise that you can share, um, Jessica mentioned early on how important the power of storytelling is. It really is. Um, and so I would encourage each of you, if you, if you don't already have your, rep your representative's numbers in your phone, you can program them in as contacts. Um, so you've got your senators on speed dial, mine are on speed dial. And um, it really can take as little as two minutes a week. I've timed it, two minutes, to, to give them a call. If you are an introvert like myself and you don't really want to talk to anybody, call after hours. They'll get the message. You can leave your voice and tell your story that way. Um, another uh, suggestion that I'll offer is that um, it, it, can, it can help to attach a new habit with a habit that you're already successful at. It's a, it's a, a technique called habit stacking. You might have encountered that before. Um, so what that looks like for me, for example, with calling my representatives is that when I take my kids to the playground, that's my cue to call my senators when they're running around on the swing set. You know, they're old enough that I don't have to hover over them anymore. Um, I'll pick up my phone and just make that phone call while I'm sitting there with, with nothing else to do. Um, so make it, uh, if you're going to, you know, 
make this easy for yourself. It, you know, call your senators or your representatives while you're standing in line or doing something where you know it's really not competing for for more of your time because I know you're busy. Another uh, idea that's very simple, um, and probably you've already done this, um, but sign up for uh, an email list like Annie's or Moms Clean Air Force, or there's lots of different climate groups that are regularly sending out emails that have uh, action ideas. They might have petitions you can sign. They might have you know, a script for a phone call to make. Um, I think those are really great to engage in because someone else has already done the work of figuring out the words <laughs> that you need to say. So, you know, many people say that they don't know what to say when they pick up the phone or they don't know, you know, what to say to their representatives over email. Um, make it easier on yourself if you're just learning and, and let someone else give you the words. Uh, and the other person on the other end of the email will be thrilled <laughs> that you signed their petition or called, uh, called your rep. And I think about small habits too as a way of building our confidence for, for larger actions. Um, you know, everything that we can do matters, everything that we can do counts, but over time we wanna grow our confidence to do even more. Um, next slide, Jessica. So one of the ways that we can do even more once we've got the confidence built is to advocate at different levels of, um, uh, of government, of, of community. And so one, um, one place you can advocate is in your, your local neighborhood. And um, one of many ways that you can um, be a climate advocate right now is to uh, advocate for electric school buses. Um, the bipartisan infrastructure bill was passed in November and it includes $5 billion for electric school buses. So this money is sitting there waiting to be sent out to school districts all around, across the country. Um, and it's a really valuable way to make a difference in, in the level of pollution in your neighborhood. So the, the pollution that comes out of diesel school buses is it's bad for the climate, but it's also bad for our kids' health. It's not good for their lungs or their, um, or their brains. So um, cleaning up our vehicles has, has multiple benefits for our health. And there's a, a link on the slide to a great website from the World Resources Institute that uh, has very practical ideas for how you can advocate um, for electric school buses within uh, your community. So I highly recommend checking that out. Next slide. And so if you are even braver uh, or feel called to uh, advocacy at the national level, another way to get involved is with EPA hearings. So uh, the Environmental Protection Agency sets um, standards, pollution guidelines for um, various chemicals and pollutants in our country. And every time they introduce a new rule or propose a change to a rule, there is a public comment period where you can uh, sign up to testify at a public hearing or submit a public comment over email. Um, this can seem intimidating if you've never done it before, but it's not as hard as it looks. Uh, it's really about storytelling, as Jessica said earlier. So um, again, if you're an introvert like me, you will be very pleased to know that uh, now that we're in two years into the pandemic, these EPA hearings are happening over Zoom. <laughs> so um, testifying at an EPA hearing is really talking for three minutes on a Zoom call um, and sharing your story about why a particular issue matters to you and what sort of expertise as a healthcare professional or a community member or a mom you might bring to that issue. And so um, just as one example, there's many examples on the horizon. Um, there's an EPA hearing next week uh, about a new um, uh, proposal they've set forth about truck pollution. Um, Annie and Miles Cleaner Force do not believe this uh, standard is strong enough. And so um, there is an opportunity for you to submit uh, public comments uh, asking EPA to set stronger standards and telling them why this is so important to you as a nurse, as a mom, as a community member, as a, as a grandparent. And there's a comment form linked, uh, linked right here on the slide that you'll uh, have access to after the presentation. And I would strongly encourage you to submit your comment um, and, and make it a habit, again, of sort of paying, uh, keeping your ear out for these opportunities to participate in a national conversation about these really important uh, climate and health issues. Next slide. Another thing that you can do that you are already doing if you're in this room is to keep learning about climate and health. So 
as Jessica mentioned earlier, nurses are trusted voices in this climate and health conversation. You, you really matter to the climate movement. And the more that you know about the, the, the health impacts of climate change, the more prepared that you will be to talk to your patients, to help educate them, to talk to your colleagues, to talk to your healthcare systems and your communities to help them really understand what's at stake here. Um, your voice uh, carries a lot of weight. So, so keep learning. Organizations like Annie Moms Clean Air Force have wonderful educational materials and there are more educational uh, resources around climate and health available every day. So I would encourage you to, to keep learning. Um, I know this stuff can be hard to learn about, but uh, you being uh, an educated, informed healthcare professional is, is a really important gift that you can give to your community. Next slide. Make sure to vote. Um, you know, I, I years ago used to be the kind of person who would vote in the big elections, but when it came to the smaller local elections, I thought, oh, that doesn't matter so much. And I just kind of didn't pay as much attention. And the older I've gotten, and the more I've learned about sort of the, uh, the situations that we're in right now and this, the, you know, what's at stake with the climate, uh, the more I realized that our, our small local elections really, really matter too. And so, um, I encourage all of you to make it a priority to vote for candidates that support strong clean air, clean energy, and climate investments in every single election. And go ahead and make that easy on yourself too by, by looking up at your local um, board of elections, put the election dates on your calendar, put the primaries on your calendar, and bring your friend to vote, make it fun. Um, you can even in many districts uh, sign up to be a precinct assistant. That's something that I've done and that's a lot of fun too, to really get involved in the local election process. So uh, supporting uh, getting, out, getting out the vote efforts is really important as well. And next slide. And finally, um, the, I'm going to leave you with uh, encouragement to practice talking about climate change. So there is really interesting uh, research from the Yale program on climate communication showing that there is a uh, significant gap in uh, between the, the number of people who are worried, concerned about climate change, and the number of people who are talking about it. And there is an amazing online resource called the Yale Climate Opinion Maps that uh, shows you the entire US, and you can break down data um, at the country level, at the state level, and even all the way down to the county level, and find out what people in your area are thinking about climate change, about, about climate policy, and what the Yale Climate Opinion Map shows about Arizona is that 65% of your fellow Arizonans are worried about climate change. That's a majority. That's, that's most of y'all. And only 35% are talking about it regularly. So that's a big gap, right? There's a big difference between people who care and people who are actually having the, the conversations that we need to have. And um, bridging that gap is gonna be really key to building the power of the social movement that we that we so desperately need for um, climate change. And, and talking about it can take practice. Like I will name from personal experience that my first conversations about climate change were very uh, unskillful. Let's put it that way. <laughs> it was me probably spilling out my fear about the end of the world in ways that nobody around me really wanted to hear. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, didn't really build bridges for a further conversation. It was, you know, it, it increased my sense of isolation because I really didn't know how to talk about this thing that was so big. Fortunately, several years later, there are resources to help you have much more skillful conversations than I was having um, several years back. And I would encourage you to tap into those resources and to remember that it, it takes practice. Um, one book that I'll highly recommend is called Saving Us by Catherine Hayhoe. She is a climate scientist who um, is uh, an incredible communicator. And her book is uh, basically about how to communicate about uh, climate change across divides in our society. So how to talk to anybody across the political spectrum, how to have meaningful conversations um, about this incredibly important issue. Her book is a great resource if this is a new skill for you um, and practice talking about it everywhere, right? Talk with your patients, talk with your friends, with your partner, with your policymakers, with your, with your healthcare systems and colleagues. And another resource I'll point you to is a, a brochure that moms and Annie did a few years back 
um, with, that has some specific talking points about how healthcare professionals can uh, talk about climate change with specific uh, language ideas for, um, for what you might say. So you may find that helpful as well. And I'll turn it back over to Jessica now. Thanks, Elizabeth. And thank you everyone again for joining us and just listening and um, being engaged. And just by being here, we know that um, you want to find ways to be involved and or be more involved in the conversation. So we just have um, some upcoming engagement opportunities in addition to the um, heavy duty trucks ruling that's coming up next week. Uh, they've actually, I just found out right before this webinar that they've added on a third day because there's been that many people that have signed up. So the, uh, I believe the sign up ended on the 5th, but the link to still sign up is still valid. Um, so you can still sign up to testify via Zoom or submit you know, written comments. Um, Annie's also hosting a virtual town hall at the end of the month on Earth Day. Um, that's gonna be more details are gonna come out about that. Um, there's gonna be a another Earth Day event hosted by Climate Action Campaign. That's gonna be in person. The location is still to be, to be decided, um, but it's gonna be on the 23rd. So weekend, if you have some free time. Um, and then Annie's also hosting a virtual nursing summit in May. So it's another way to network with um, nurses across the country virtually, so you can do it from the comfort of your own home, but still socialize and engage and learn more and um, get some more CEs as well. I'm gonna stop sharing so we can maybe like chit chat a little bit. Okay. I didn't see. Uh, I'm just curious, let's see, yeah, we have a little bit of time. I'm curious um, if anyone had any comments or questions or what um, you guys' backgrounds are in terms of healthcare or environment or both. Um, I'll, I'll start, I'll share something. I'm Carol Stevens and um, I am the chair of the Arizona Nurse Association Political Action Committee. And so we're right, in the middle of um, vetting candidates that are running for the 2022 elections in our state. And um, we vet those that are running for the House or the Senate. And um, the date to file was just uh, finished April 4th. So we have a list of, oh, I don't know, 160 some candidates. And as a political action committee, what we're going to be doing is um, looking at all those candidates and sending them a survey. And what we've incorporated this year, thanks to kind of the buzz from AHNE and, and my colleagues, um, is a question on um, climate change or basically um, kind of like social determinants of health. And that's something new. We haven't asked them about that before. So what we'll be able to get is collect is information from each candidate, um, kind of how they see um, the relevancy, the priority, um, you know, would they put resources and, and money into efforts to um, address climate change issues that impact health, you know? So um, we're excited about that. And, um, I'll keep you posted on how that turns out. Um, we'll probably get the surveys out next month and, uh, or this month actually, and um, be interviewing the candidates and then we'll come up with our endorsed list of candidates. But you all uh, alluded to that, you know, we're talking to legislators and, and um, because they're the ones that make things happen, obviously. And um, so I think we had got a, a little bit of a head start in Arizona. I don't know about other states, but I'm happy that we're finally going in this direction. That's definitely great to hear. And it, it highlights what Elizabeth was saying to the importance and the benefit of having a community um, because there's definitely a strength in that. Um, and obviously individuals running for office or in office um, recognize the strength of numerous voices, again, in, in a profession that's um, so rooted in public service and honesty and health and 
pretty much all things good. So <laughs> you kind of can't argue with when a whole bunch of nurses are asking you what your um, intentions are in terms of protecting public health and protecting individuals in their communities. So that's really great to hear. Uh, Peter, and about what your, your background. Um, sure, um, I'm Annabelle Castro Thompson. I'm a nurse practitioner and I'm senior vice president of health equity at Equality Health. And so um, my, I, I oversee uh, the cultural care model. Uh, we provide care through the lens of culture and we do it towards specific communities, Latino community, African-American community, Native American communities and other communities. And then I also oversee the social determinants of health here at Equality Health. And so it, for a long time, I've known about the environmental impacts or what we call environmental justice in communities of color. And uh, as a nurse practitioner, I've had plenty of patients uh, that are being impacted. Um, I am uh, also a board member of Annie, and so I work closely uh, with them. And so I, I'm, I'm really, uh, I, I was, I'm fortunate to be on this webinar today. I wanted to meet you, Felicia, and, and know that, that uh, you, you have another voice here advocating in Arizona uh, for our population. And Elizabeth, I wanted to meet you as well. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of what your organization is doing. And so I, I do think that there's a lot of opportunities for advocacy here in our state. A, our, our climate is warming and it's only going to impact us even more, right? And, and it seems like we're running out of time to make really impactful a change. And so how are we going to ensure that our communities of colors, which are greatly impacted, are resilient, that they have the information and the resources uh, to effectuate change? Um, I think it was you, Felicia, who said climate anxiety and climate anxiety is real. And so the more we talk about it and the more we give people the tools and the understanding and the, the fact that uh, they can actuate and create change, they'll feel less anxiety around it. And so um, I'm a huge advocate. It's nice to meet you. And I look forward to collaborating with both of you in the future. Thank you. That was actually Elizabeth that said the climate anxiety, but I, I, I concur with her. <laughs> yes, sorry, Elizabeth. Thank you for that though. Peter, have a... Got to click the right button to make things work. Um, I'm, a, I'm a registered nurse. I work currently with um, the um, Poison Control Center um, at Banner University. And, um, you know, and I've been a member of um, ANA and, and um, both the Colorado uh, Nurses Association and um, short time here in Arizona, the last seven years. Um, I've never been um, a participating member um, I've always just uh, sent in my dues and um, I've recently, I don't know, felt more involved. So uh, to get um, active and, and help promote um, nursing um, and what we do as nurses. Um, as far as climate goes, um, it's, it's, you know, it, it impacts everyone. Um, in, my, in my role as a um, uh, certified poison information specialist at, at um, the Poison Control Center. Um, we deal a lot with that with the um, the heat stress and uh, helping um, physicians in outlying facilities manage those patients um, with the um, increasingly warm temperatures and that in that shorter winter season, um, the scorpions and the rattlesnakes um, become active um, far far sooner and stay active um, far longer. Um, so I think um, to date, um, this season, we've already had four, um, maybe five rattlesnake um, envenomations um, here in the, um, in the valley, which is, from what I'm told, is, is, is early. Um, uh, um, so uh, so it's, it's interesting to um, join these webinars and, and get involved, and um, I'm just happy to participate. And we're thankful to have like your your differing um, and unique perspectives because they all kind of shine a light on how regardless of what corner of the country you you come from your our environments are changing and it's directly related to our climate changing 
um, and being that we are the first line of healthcare and, you know, whether it's in a community center or um, in the hospital or wherever you're working, we're seeing it directly at, because we're taking care of people who are, you know, dealing with it. And that's why we want to encourage more nurses to get involved with the conversation because we have hands-on experience. Um, and we just want to stress more and more, like, you don't have to have a highest level of like understanding of the legislative process because you start where with what you're comfortable with and you know what you know and you know we're we're health scientists and you can't really um you can't really argue with with a personal story and with the expertise that we bring to the table um so those stories are really really beneficial and they hold a lot of weight sometimes they're more compelling, honestly, than a whole bunch of statistics and scientific facts. So we wanna um, engage more nurses and give more opportunities for people to get involved and like offer their, their perspective and their feedback. Yeah, I just wanna add on to that. And one of the, the primary things, and I think all of us have just brought this up, is that it's, it, you, you can't emphasize enough how important it is not just to vote, but to be an informed voter. So many, almost most people vote. I mean, that are you know educated, whatever they they tend to vote, but they're not informed. Oftentimes, they just go down D D D R R R I or whatever, or male or female. But as we know, it doesn't go by gender, especially in Arizona. There's not always the ones who care about climate are not always just the female politicians, unfortunately. So it's really important to be an informed voter and talk to your peers. They'll listen to you. You just say, hey, that's not. I people used to always before I even ran for office, people always came to me to ask because they know I did this thing called a proposition pizza party where we'd sit for the proposition, then the politics, we'd sit down with my friends of them from all walks of life and we'd have pizza and we talk and we assign each person a proposition or a candidate and they had to research it. So it got them engaged that way. Like if you're a law enforcement, you, hey, what are this this law, this policy about law enforcement? What do you think about it? We kind of and then we'd have fun with it and then we just open our eyes from that perspective or health care what do they think about healthcare? You know, so they give the resident experts that policy or, pol you know, the politician uh, and discuss it. And it made it fun and it made them form and it made them want to learn more about what, because all these policies and stuff are written so in such vague or you know, proposition, you don't understand them. So it's really important to uh, engage people and encourage them to get out. And like Carol said, Annie, the PAC, uh, a and, I'm sorry, ANA, the PAC, uh, uh, they, all these PACs, they, they vet pay, it does not, they're not biased towards one group or another, but it just tends to be one group happens to be more concerned about climate change right now. They, it's become politicized, unfortunately. So Sierra Club, any group that shares your values that you happen to belong to or want to, look at what Sierra Club, who they endorse. They vet the candidates very well. Like Carol said, the surveys, they, they, you have to go through a lengthy survey process, interview process. So you can't just BS your way through it as a politician and say, oh yeah, I agree with this or I disagree with that. So really encourage your friends and family and your, your coworkers to be informed and, and be that resident person that with the knowledge of the candidates and the policies and the propositions. So they'll come to you in, the, in one stop shop, you know? So I really encourage you to do that. Absolutely. And as Elizabeth said too, once they're in office, feel free to continue to call them and let them know that we are still watching and we really need climate provisions. It's very, very important at this point to invest in sweeping climate provisions. So to just kind of continue the pressure, um, that's a good note to kind of end on We're about at time, but